Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Gaston Hall for our Marver H. Bernstein Symposium. And I wish to offer my appreciation to the Department of Government and its chair, Dr. Charles King, for their efforts in bringing us together today. I also wish to recognize and thank the Honorable Robert Katzman, who I will introduce in just a moment, and Bill Trainer, the Dean of our Law Center, who will moderate this conversation with our distinguished guest this afternoon. We're deeply grateful to all those who have generously supported this symposium and who have enabled us to bring such esteemed guests to our campus over many years, from Vice President Al Gore and journalist Tim Russert, to Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Senator Patrick Leahy for this forum which honors Professor Marver Bernstein, his contributions to our community, to our understanding of the United States political system. Dr. Bernstein, whose work in the areas of regulation, personnel, and administrative reform continues to influence scholars today. He served as the founding dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, then as president of Brandeis, and then for the last seven years of his life as a professor of politics and philosophy here on our campus at Georgetown. It's a privilege for us to host this symposium in his honor and to provide a forum for ongoing discussion with scholars, policymakers, and students on the challenges and opportunities confronting our institutions. This year, we have the special privilege of welcoming the Honorable Stephen Breyer, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, a member of the court since 1994. Justice Breyer described the purpose of the Constitution in his nomination hearing, in his words, to guarantee people the rights that will enable them to lead lives of dignity. We're deeply honored to have him with us today to share his insights and reflections with our community. To introduce Justice Breyer, it's my pleasure to introduce Chief Judge Robert Katzman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, appointed by President Clinton to the federal bench in 1999. He began his service as Chief Judge in 2013. We're grateful for his contributions to our campus as the Walsh Professor of Government and a Professor of Law and Public Policy. He also serves on the Board of Visitors of our Law Center and is one of the founders of this symposium. Before his appointment to the Second Circuit, he was a fellow of the Governmental Studies Program of the Brookings Institution. He served as the president of the Governance Institute. In 2001, he received the Charles E. Merriam Award from the American Political Science Association. In 2003, he was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Judge Katzman, we are honored to welcome you back to campus this afternoon and to again have your participation in this very special symposium. I want to thank you for your leadership, your friendship, your generosity, and your sustained commitment to our community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Robert Katzman. Almost uh, good evening, uh, President DeJoya, Justice Breyer, Dr. Breyer, Dean Trainer, Chairman King, faculty, students, guests. I thank President uh, DeJoya for his very kind words, for his welcoming presence, for his steadfast support of the Bernstein Symposium, and for elevating these proceedings with his presence. Being here is a very special personal experience thinking back some 22 years ago when we inaugurated the Bernstein Symposium in this hall with then Vice President Gore offering the intellectual justifications for the reinventing government project. The Bernstein Symposium brings together the campuses of Georgetown, the Department of Government, the School of Foreign Service, the Law School. It has, had, has over the last generation been graced by a distinguished group, as President DeJoya indicated. I knew Marver Bernstein very well, and he helped me uh, get this job at, at Georgetown along with uh, Bob Petoskey. The idea of 
bringing to the university somebody who could bridge the campuses. And so having been involved for a generation in this symposium means so much to me. As I think back about the friends of uh, Marva Bernstein, uh, Marva and Sheva Bernstein, the late Lawrence Goldmunz, Michael and Susan Gelman, who are here with us today, and being in, able to be involved in this symposium means more than I can say. And the privilege of saying a few words about Justice Stephen Breyer, our Bernstein speaker, is very special to me, as he has been very special for more than a generation to my family. So before we get to the main event, I'm going to speak to you very briefly about three people, Marva Bernstein, Justice Stephen Breyer, and Dean William Trainer, the great dean of the Law Center. My friend Marva Bernstein was an institution builder, as Jack DeJoya has said. His works, The Job of the Federal Executive and Regulating Business by Independent Commission, are prime examples of his, his work on trying to understand how government works and how to make it better. A scholar of regulation, he formulated the concept of the regulatory life cycle, now a common term in the field. Marva Bernstein would have been so proud that this year's Bernstein honoree is Justice Stephen Breyer. Justice Breyer's accomplishments as a distinguished scholar and law professor and as a public servant in all three branches of government are prodigious. There is no jurist who has better articulated the idea that law should work for people, no jurist more committed to making government work more effectively, no jurist today who has taken through his outside activities to educating the public, no jurist who better fits the idea, the ideal of the judge as citizen of the world. So in my brief time, I'd like to just offer some thoughts on some of these very rare qualities. First, making law work for people. For Justice Breyer, government exists to address very human problems. And throughout his career, he has never lost sight of those human concerns as he examines government's role. Law is not just about doctrine and abstract concepts. Law itself is a human institution serving the human the basic human or societal needs. As he put it, law must work for people. He observed the vast array of constitution, statutes, rules, regulations, practices, and procedures. That huge vast web has a single basic purpose. That purpose is to help the many different individuals who make up America from so many different backgrounds and circumstances with so many different needs and homes to live together productively, harmoniously, and in freedom. In his writings, he is very much aware of not only how the disposition of a case might affect the litigants at hand, but also the broader society. From his opinions, we learn about his conception of a judge's role in a democratic society, the application of active liberty, about the need for a degree of judicial modesty and understanding of the elected branches. Second making government work more effectively. Throughout his career, Justice Breyer has been dedicated to the conviction that our institutions, with proper consideration, attentive care, and occasional correction, can work for the people, consistent with the framers' constitutional design. He has been vitally concerned with basic questions. How do, how do our institutions actually work? How can they be made to work better? A student of regulation, he asked how we can promote processes, analytical thinking, and policies that enhance the quality of life. A practitioner in the administration of justice, Justice Breyer has worked tirelessly for a generation on sentencing policy to reducing unreasonable disparity in sentencing. In approaching these questions and issues, Justice Breyer is very consciously a problem solver who has equipped himself to tackle these concerns through a career that has mixed the intellectual life of the academy with the real world of governing in all three branches of government, as a special assistant to the assistant attorney general for antitrust, as an as, as assistant special prosecutor, consultor, consultant, and chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee, a commissioner 
of the U.S. Sentencing Committee, a Commission and, of course, as a judge. His life in academia and government gives credibility in, to both worlds. When he speaks, for example, to congressional staffs, he establishes an immediate connection to, with his audience because of those shared experiences. One example, a few years ago, when I was chairing one of the committees of the Judicial Conference, Justice Breyer gave me the idea of approaching the Pew Charitable Trusts to sponsor gatherings for judges and legislators in informal settings to discuss non-agenda items of mutual interest as a way of fostering better communications and understanding. That those meetings have been successful, bringing together the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, owes much to Justice Breyer's presence and his involvement. Through such exchanges beyond the courthouse, Justice Breyer's example instructs us that there is the prospect of dialogue and learning. Third, the judge's educator. A hallmark of a Breyer opinion is that it can be understood by the interested citizen, its graceful prose shorn of footnotes. His books, similarly, are accessible to the intelligent system, citizen, not just the lawyer. He has a basic faith in the people, and he well appreciates that the maintenance of a vital independent judiciary depends upon the support of the people. He has thus been at the forefront, for example, of designing courthouses that are welcoming to all. To that end, he was deeply involved in the uh, building of the Moakley Courthouse in Boston, a structure which is consciously designed as an inviting public space open to the public and as a venue for communal activities. As he wrote, judges can explain in terms the public can understand just what the Constitution is about. We judges cannot insist that Americans participate in government, but we can make clear that our Constitution depends on it. Their participation is necessary. At a time of separateness and division, Justice Breyer articulates his vision of life, of a flow between citizens and the branches of government, and encourages a vision of community that unites us. Fourth, judge as citizen of the world. Life in a court, especially in an appellate court, can be confining, indeed isolating. Justice, Justice Breyer's life as a judge teaches us that we can still be part of the world even as we adjudicate cases. With his wide-ranging intellect and insatiable thirst for knowledge, he has traveled the globe continuing to learn. A quick review of his speeches makes the point. Two summers ago, I met a judge from a Southeast Asian country, he said. In another talk, he remarked, I was at dinner and happened to be introduced to a Russian general. There is no justice, no judge, who better epitomizes the judge as citizen of the world than Justice Breyer who encourages us to learn from other societies. As Judge Richard Posner has written, and he's not, uh, he doesn't distribute the bone mows uh, easily, uh, Justice Breyer, I quote, has long been known as the most cosmopolitan justice, the justice most familiar with the laws of other nations and most concerned with how U.S. courts can cope with those laws when they impinge upon American national interests or are invoked in U.S. courts. The esteem with which he is held throughout the world is legion. In France, he is one of only a handful of individuals, a foreign citizenship, who is a member of the prestigious, exclusive Académie des sciences, des sciences morales et politiques. He reads Proust in French. For the book, Judges in Contemporary Democracy, he translated the French portions into English. Today, our conversation focuses on Justice Breyer's latest and much heralded book, The Court and the World, a book which argues for increased awareness by our courts of the legal system of other countries, not as a luxury, but as a necessity in this global interdependent world. Everyone in this hall uh, will be given a copy, and there is much to be learned from it. So at a time of growing cynicism and acrimony in our public discourse, Justice Breyer summons the better part of our nature through reason and persuasion to find ways for our institutions to work for the common good 
inspires all of us by his example to serve justice. For that, we owe him so much. Now, a few brief words on Dean William Trainer. I can't think of a better in interlocutor for today's conversation than Dean William Trainer of Georgetown University Law Center. Dean Trainer has been an acknowledged national leader of legal education in two law schools, Fordham and then Georgetown. And indeed, when uh, it was announced that he was leaving uh, Fordham to go to Georgetown, it was a, a day of mourning uh, in the Second Circuit. I have observed his leadership as a member uh, of the Board of Vis Visitors of the Law School, as President Zdroja noted, and watched with admiration as he is confronted with great vision and energy, difficult challenges confronting legal education. Indeed, he's been ahead of the curve in identifying some of those challenges. And I think one of the reasons that Georgetown has been so successful uh, in meeting those challenges is because of that vision. He's a much respected scholar, a summa cum laude graduate of Yale College with a law degree from Yale, a PhD in history, and with distinguished scholarly con contributions on such diverse subjects as takings law and judicial review. He was a favorite clerk of the late great James L. Oaks of the Second Circuit. And my court has continually called upon Bill, even in recent years, to participate in its work, and he has done so brilli brilliantly. Not only has he been a respected law school dean, teacher, and scholar, he's also been a distinguished public servant, having been deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice, as an associate independent counsel in the Iran-Contra investigation, just to name a couple. He's a multifaceted person of great accomplishment. Justice Breyer and Dean Trainer, we look forward now to your conversation. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Judge Kasman. I'm very grateful for those very kind words. And um, you know, it's it really, it's an honor uh, to be part of the conversation honoring Marver Bernstein and his extraordinary career. And, uh, and it's a privilege to be in this conversation with Justice Breyer. Uh, you know, under any circumstances, we'd be just delighted uh, to be listening to you. But our conversation today, I think, is particularly timely. So we're going to be talking about The Court in the World, uh, which is really, it's a wonderful book on American law and the new global realities and particularly timely for us here at Georgetown. Uh, as Judge Katzman said, this is really an event that brings together people from all of the different schools. It's from the law school and foreign service and the government department. And we're all focusing now at Georgetown on how do we prepare people for an interconnected world that's very different from the kind of world that when I graduated from college we were preparing people for. And so the opportunity to listen to you after you've written this incredibly thoughtful book on the court and world is just a great privilege. Oh, it's very nice to be here. I mean, look, this is a, th thank you, President Joy, and thank, thank Bob, that was a great introduction. He left out certain things, such as my first book I wrote on regulation, uh, got it in the hands of a, a real reviewer, you know, a public, a, sort of, a rather a technical subject, but the LA Times reviewed it. This is the review. Uh, in the uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Alice emerges from the pool of tears with the dormouse who begins to read Hume's History of England. Why are you reading that, says Alice? Because, says the dormouse, we're wet. And this is the driest thing I know. <laughs> that was before Breyer wrote this book. He said, he said, he said. <laughs> there we are. But I, and I feel particularly, I'm inside, this is a beautiful building. I mean, I usually go down, you know, I usually am down at the Law Center, which I like very much. It's a great law school. Uh, it's pretty far down, though, and we live pretty near here. So I, when I'm usually on this campus, uh, either uh, uh, 
I probably want to go look at the fields over there. They're beautiful baseball fields, lacrosse fields, and so forth. And I will meet students, usually uh, once or twice a week in this area uh, at 2 in the morning. I, I don't know if they want to talk about it. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, it's fun. And now I'm inside. It is beautiful. And uh, I appreciate this invitation. But go ahead, Phil, because we're going to talk about that. <laughs> this book so, is less dry. This, now, this less book dry. is, <laughs> you're in for a real treat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not dry at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's start about, you know, what are you trying to do in the book? Well, I'd, I'd say if I wanted an analogy, it's to clear up something in my mind. I mean, on the one hand, I did notice over time, I've been on the court for a while now, about 22 years, 21, 22 years. And uh, uh, over time, there are more and more and more cases where you really have to know something about what goes beyond our own shores, or you can't get the case right. So I wanted to describe that situation, which I've seen every day and seen change over time. I want to describe it. In a sense, it's just a report from the front. If you've read, and probably a lot of you have, The Charter House of Parma, and if you haven't read it, you ought to read it. Great, great novel. Fabulous. I mean, that's Stendhal. He knows more about women and politics than anyone alive. I mean, he isn't alive, actually. But, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, it opens with uh, uh, the hero, uh, Fabrice Del Dongo, is on the Battle of Waterloo. He's at the field, on the field. And there are bullets whizzing by. And Napoleon is going back and forth on his horse, and there's clouds and everything. And he thinks to himself, you know, something really important is going on here. I wish I knew what it was. <laughs> and that's sort of how I feel, and I think many people feel, when we hear words like globalization, uh, interdependence, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, you know, we hear cliches all the time. So I thought maybe it would be helpful to try to make, from a very narrow point of view, my own experience, very concretely, what that means in the Supreme Court of the United States. So I'm simply reporting. I'm giving some examples. I'm showing why it's important that we know more than our own country when we're deciding matters that are certainly going to affect us. And uh, there we are. That's why you have lots of examples. Now, and was there an aha moment? You, you, know, you talk about how when you, when you came onto the court, a uh, comparatively small percentage of the cases were global in dimension. And now it's a big part of your docket. Was there a moment when you realized that, oh, it's changed? Well, I, you go to, uh, I, I've, I've gone to a certain amount of work when you write an opinion, even though the law clerks do help, <laughs> but the uh, judges do go to quite a lot of work, too, and uh, there we are. Uh, and I've written a few opinions uh, which uh, required uh, fairly lengthy dissents, which were uh, complicated to look up and so forth. And, and I thought, yeah, people should know what's going on. And even in cases where you'll never find out, because you won't read what was the issue in the case. We had a case called Bond. And Bond involved, we thought, whether an old opinion of Holmes, which said that the treaty power in this document, which this document gives Congress the power, and the president the power to make treaties, and Holmes, in a case involving birds that were flying into Lake Michigan, I think, or something, said that this document gives, on that clause, the, pres uh, the President and Congress power to do more than they could do without it. It's a power-granting clause. And uh, we thought this bond might be an opportunity uh, where they were going to argue that should be overruled. And some of us thought good, and some of us thought bad, but we never got to the issue. It was distracting. The case involved a, a woman who discovered that her best friend was having a love affair with her husband, had a baby, and in order to punish the best friend, since she worked in a photographic shop, uh, got uh, some chemicals there and put them on the doorknob of the best friend's house, uh, believing that those chemicals would turn her hand red and she'd get a rash. She came outside, she touched the door, it turned her hand red, and she worked out something's going wrong here. So she went to the doctor and the police, and she did have a little rash, and the upshot was the government uh, prosecuted her for violating the Chemical Weapons Treaty. 
answer. In any case, I'll spare you that story. Go read it. And if you read it really carefully, you will see that really underlying this are some potential issues of tremendous importance internationally, which we never reached or decided. Well, <laughs> now, uh, I'm simply pointing out there were many instances where I suddenly thought, gee, I think uh, uh, it's worth telling people what's going on. So, let's, so the, the book is organized as a series of case studies, different areas. Um, so let's, let's start by national security. Uh, and actually, Neil Katyal, who was a central figure in litigating uh, uh, in, these, in this area, uh, is joining us in the audience. So tell us about um, kind of the arc that you, you really start with Korematsu. How does the kind of the changing interconnectedness of the world shape national security law? Uh, Korematsu, wait, this is uh, Georgetown. It's filled with the history of foreign relations. I mean, let's go back to Cicero. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> after all, I, I use this first part. I want to bring people up to speed. I want to show them this long arc of where we have been in this very touchy area. Uh, after all, the Constitution gives to the President and to Congress, not to the court, the power to protect us when there is serious, when there are serious problems of national security or war. But the court has the power to protect certain basic civil liberties. And what happens when those two clash? Now, that's an old problem. But by bringing you up to speed, I'll help to make my point uh, that we better know something about it if we're judges. Why hasn't this come up long before? Cicero. I studied Cicero once in high school. I can't remember what he'd said, but I know it was very good. <laughs> One of the things that he said uh, was, uh, uh, in time of war, the laws fall silent. Note my translation, what he actually said, something like arma, et, whatever it is. I translated it for a long time as uh, when the cannons roar, the laws fall silent. I thought that was pretty clever of me. And somebody pointed out in the audience said, but the Romans didn't have cannons. <laughs> so that was the end of that translation. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you get the point. And for years and years, courts followed that. Go back to Abraham Lincoln. Thousands of people put in prison. But of course, he had the Civil War. But thousands of civilians put in prison. Stewart, the Secretary of State, called in the British ambassador. He says, look, I can push this button and have anyone I want in New York thrown into prison. I can push this one and have anyone I want in uh, Indiana thrown into prison. Tell me, does the Queen of England have such power? And what did the courts do about this kind of problem? Too much power or not? They didn't decide. Not during the war, anyway. There was one case in the war that petered out pretty quickly, but nothing, virtually nothing, until after the war is over. Then the courts will decide and go look at the same kind of thing, really, during World War I. And the number of instances in which uh, President Wilson uh, really did things that learned at hand, certainly thought violated the First Amendment, courts stay out, out of it. And then get to World War II, mm -hmm. and now we have Korematsu, where 70,000 American citizens, American citizens of Japanese origin, were moved against their will in early 1942 from the West Coast and put into camps. Mm -hmm. Fred Korematsu said they can't do this. Fred Korematsu, I'd met him once. I met him because in, in Cambridge, uh, our next door neighbor was the daughter of Ernie Bezik. Ernie Bezik, who used to play uh, poker with my father in San Francisco, was the director of the ACLU. And uh, he represented Korematsu. And the ACLU wouldn't sign their name to the brief. Remember? We were, you don't remember. I was so young, I can't remember either, but I was there. 1942, we are at war. And there's a concern that the Japanese are going to invade San Francisco. Uh, and General Witt, the, the uh, uh, commander of the Sixth Army in the Presidio, says there's nothing to do about this but move all the Japanese. All of them, 70,000 American citizens. And uh, he said, well, there's 738 instances of signaling, probably to submarines, there's sabotage. 
And Earl Warren, who was governor of California, was totally for it. He said it's the worst. He wasn't governor then. He was attorney general. He said it's the worst thing I've done later. And J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, said don't do it. No need. Very interesting. But they did it. And Korematsu, who I did meet across the street, he's a feisty guy. I liked him very much. Uh, and he said uh, he didn't think that the government of the United States could do such a thing, nor did Bezig. And they got it to the Supreme Court in 44, by which time there was no risk. And everyone knew it, and he was sure he was going to win, but six to three he lost. And by that time, by the way, the lawyers in the Justice Department, you've got, sort of got me off on this because it's rather very interesting, the detail. Burling and Ennis, they were supposed to argue this for the department, and uh, they got suspicious of Witt's reasons. So they called in the Federal Communications Commission and say, well, look into the 738 instances of signaling. And uh, they come back uh, two weeks later, stacked like that, and said there wasn't one. There wasn't one. Every one of those was just like a buck private not knowing how to work the machines or something like that. And uh, 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 the lawyer said, but, but you did this awfully quickly. He said, oh, no, we didn't do it now. We did it in early 42. We showed this material to uh, the general. And of course, J. Edgar Hoover said those five instances of sabotage, that they took place after they were moved. You know, I mean, really. And so, and uh, the, the, the lawyers wouldn't sign the brief. And uh, what's his, uh, Wexler was the uh, uh, assistant Herbert attorney Wexler. general, Herbert J. Wexler, great name in legal history. And uh, he wrote a footnote that nobody could understand. Perfect. He got them to sign the brief. And if you read it very closely, you know, very closely, you'd see that the government was disowning it in the Defense Department. But boy, you had to be careful reading that. And I thought, well, the court never really read it until I read the transcript of the oral argument. And Charlie Horsky, another name well known in Washington under Roosevelt, he represented the Japanese American Defense League. And he said to the court, read that footnote. They must have read it. They must have read it. And it was really only Murphy who got, I thought, totally right. And I thought maybe somebody in the department told him. And uh, so I called his law clerk, who's still alive, age 97, Dressman, who wrote the procedure, the practice of the procedure of practice uh, of the Supreme Court, Eugene Cressman. I called him and said, you were the law clerk then. He was. And I said, did somebody tell you all these facts? And he says, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> all right, there we are. But uh, in any case, that story is interesting. Six to three. And I later found out that Black, the great civil libertarian, went into that conference room. And it was Black, Douglas, Frankfurter, all in the majority. And they, Black said, well, somebody has to run this war. It's Roosevelt or us, and we can't. All right? Now, go forward a little. Korean War. And there you have the steel seizure case, where Jackson says to Truman, no. You can't seize the mills, even though you need the steel for the troops fighting in Korea without this approval of Congress. Now, I, in my own mind, who's Jackson fighting? Roosevelt. But he can't really tell Roosevelt no because Roosevelt's dead by now. And it's easier to tell Truman no because he's less popular. But they did say no. Cicero? Uh -huh. Not so much there. Now we get to the cases that uh, Neil was involved in and we get to the uh, uh, Guantanamo cases, four cases four cases, and uh, every one of them is won by the detainee. The detainees are not popular. Bin Laden chauffeur is not popular. Uh, Congress passed a law saying they couldn't use the courts, and the Supreme Court said that law, and Boumedien said the law is unconstitutional. And uh, the key, I think, if six words or so written by Sandra O'Connor, which I joined. She said the Constitution does not write the president a blank check not even in time of war or national security emergency. Uh-huh, easy to say. And uh, now the question that should pop into your mind is, all right, it doesn't write a blank check. What kind of check does it write? Mm -hmm. You see, long wind up, short pitch. But that's where we are, that's where we are. 
And uh, before you say, and we have criticized on all sides for that. I mean, uh, Xi, you know nothing about security. Let the president. Ah, do you want to go back to Korematsu? Hmm, maybe not such a good idea. But that's where the assumed answer to that question leads. Or, from the other side, why did you just so reticent to deciding this just question just narrowly? Why just uh, not give us a little advice on whether we can use hearsay or not? And of course, the truthful answer to that is, I don't know the answer to those questions. So the most I can get from that long windup is that we're in the business, which is a dangerous, difficult, and very sensitive, tricky business. And so we better know something about which we speak. And we can be educated to a degree by the lawyers and by, uh, there are many ways of educating judges and lawyers try to do it every day. And that's the challenge. That's what I'm trying to say, that in this area of uh, national security versus civil liberties, the lawyers are in it. They'll say to the government, why, why did you do it? And the government better have an answer. And uh, they'll say, why didn't you do it this way? Much less restrictive, and the government better have an answer to that too. And what do we do with classified information in respect to that? And how broadly do we decide a case? And all I'm saying there is we seem to be in this business. I think probably the alternatives are not being in it are worse. But then the challenge is to find out how to do it. And if you think the judge just automatically gets to a right answer, you're wrong. Uh, were educated by lawyers and other judges and people who have access to information. And that, of course, is the challenge that I'm trying to pose. Right, so, I mean, so one of the things that, uh, that you focus on is the way in which the judge has to find out what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. very literally. So you go black could say, we we're just going to let Roosevelt figure it out. But that doesn't work anymore. It didn't work in Korematsu, but now it even more powerfully doesn't work. Um, and so then the question is, you know, how does the court find out what's going on in the world? You know, particularly as you're dealing with foreign laws, as you're dealing with markets abroad. So, so you know, you start with a focus on national security, but let me, you know, shift to another example. Um, so copyright law. So the book opens with uh, Kurtzing versus Wiley, which is a question uh, involving copyright law. And... Uh, books that are published abroad. So would you like to talk a little bit about that and how you approach a case like this and how you decide how to, how to come out? See, when we're in the security area, I can retreat to saying, well, the least you should know is how other countries are dealing with a similar problem. You don't have to follow them. Maybe you wouldn't, but it won't hurt. Now we suddenly get to commerce. In commerce, there are cases all over the lot. There's antitrust, there's copyright, and, and uh, why are we into foreign things on that? Well, here's the case. A uh, 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 Thailand, from Thailand, a foreign student is at Cornell, and he discovers that his textbooks are rather expensive. I don't know if you've discovered that or not, but the, the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, uh, same textbook is available in Thailand in English at a lower price. And he says to his parents, send me a few. And they sent more than a few, but uh, he then had to sell them. And uh, after a while, uh, the publisher got a little annoyed and sued him. And the question was whether after buying them for sale, he can do what he wants with them. And that's a difficult question under the statute. And the answer lies in some obscure language in the middle of this very long statute. Uh, which could be interpreted in several different ways. But what interests me for present purposes about that case is I walk into my office, there's a stack of books like this. Briefs, they're not brief, but a huge, huge stack of briefs. And they're filed not only by American lawyers and uh, law firms, they're amicus curiae briefs. They're designed to help us, half help us this way, half help us that way. But the, the, they are lawyers all over the world. Uh, there are governments filing briefs. There are, there are institutions in Asia, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of businesses and others and government officials are filing briefs in our court. I said, why in this case, which is a you know, pretty technical 
thing about whether this student can buy some books somewhere and bring them over to his uh, 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 university in the United States and sell them. Well, why are there briefs like that? And I get to the answer about here, uh, where one of the briefs says, copyright today is not simply a question of books. It's not simply a question of, of books or books and films or books and films and music. He says it is everywhere, everywhere. Uh, automobiles, try that. They have software, and the software is copyrighted. Or go into any shop you want, and you will see goods, and they have labels, and the labels are copyrighted. And down towards the end, it says, your decision in this case is going to affect 2.4 or 2.3 trillion dollars worth of commerce. And that's a lot of money even today. And it's all over the world, you see. And to get the answer in that case, to try to get it right, I think you have to know something about the Berne Convention, which is an international copyright convention. You have to know something about how publishers act all over different countries and different parts of the world. In other words, you have to know something about practices and the law, too, in other cases. Or in Ecuador, we have a, uh, uh, a, a vitamin distributor. And the vitamin distributor uh, wants to sue a vitamin uh, manufacturer who he says is part of a vitamin cartel all over the world, raising prices and the manufacturers in Holland. And uh, he wants to sue for damages, and he files his lawsuit in New York. Can he? Can he? Why did he sue, it in, New sue in New York? Well, maybe the price of vitamins was so high that he couldn't buy them, and he was too weak to get to Europe. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> Another possible reason is that treble damages are given in New York, you see. So can he, in fact, sue uh, under our law or not? We have briefs in that case uh, from the EU telling us how their anti-cartel authority works. Uh, from Canada, I believe, Britain, a lot of foreign countries. Why? Because our decision interpreting that American statute and how it applies is going to affect them a lot. And they want to tell us how. They want to tell us how, in their view, we can get our antitrust enforcers and their antitrust enforcers working together in harmony through our interpretation rather than at cross purposes. And that played quite a role in the decision. Similar kind of thing with securities. Similar kind of thing with discovery cases. It's all over the place. So, and so, you know, one dimension of this is very striking is the stakes are so high uh, in a truly global economy. Um, I mean, I was, Judge Katzman noted that I clerked on the Second Circuit. Essentially, the same issue in curtsing was before the Second Circuit 30 years ago. And it was really trivial. You know, it was a question of could you take textbooks produced in the United States and abroad and bring them into the United States. Now it's more than $2 trillion. Um, the other point that you raise is the, the focus on harmonizing uh, our law with law abroad. So how do you, let's talk about that. Is the, why, is that a, why is that a goal that you want to focus on? And again, how do you understand the way in which foreign law works? Well, in contrast, let's take a securities case. And by the way, this wasn't controversial to refer to what foreign countries wanted. Uh, Justice Scalia, a good friend, I miss him a lot, and, and we were on the same side. Uh, I, uh, a uh, uh, plaintiff in uh, Australia uh, bought some shares over the Australian exchange in a big Australian company, and they discovered later that he says that the uh, overpriced because the Australian company had bought another company which was overpriced, and that other company, by the way, did business in Florida, and the land that was its biggest asset or whatever its biggest asset was overpriced. So you have a fraud over here in the United States involving a company uh, that is sold over the Australian exchange. And, uh, to Australians, and does our anti-fraud law and the Securities Act apply? Well, I think if that case had come up before Judge Friendly, mm -hmm. under one of our greatest judges, uh, in the 40s or 50s, he would have said yes. I'm pretty sure he would have said yes. I'm not positive, of course. The answer today was no. And I think a lot of it was affected by the fact that we received briefs. The, uh, Nino uh, wrote the opinion, and he quotes all these briefs. You know, people all over the world telling us, we have our way of going about this, which is working pretty well, and please do not get involved, because this is what's going to happen if you do. Mm -hmm. So if we want 
a world where finance is worldwide and combating fraud is a worldwide effort, uh, I think to the extent possible, we interpret statutes which permit us to so interpret them in a way that's going to coordinate efforts and help combat this fraud across the world rather than a way that will put everybody at cross purposes and work counterproductively. That's normal when judges approach difficult statutory problems. And it's just that today, a lot of those problems require you to look beyond your own shores. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm, what I mean by working harmoniously. That's what you find in all kinds of areas. So when human rights, too, by the way. Let's talk about human rights. Uh, let's talk about the alien tort statute. Well, I uh, think uh, this is a famous woman, Dolly Phil Artiga. Dolly Phil Artiga in the 70s goes to New York. She finds in New York a fellow citizen, both from Paraguay. She's from Paraguay, he's from Paraguay. And she recognizes in that person the man who, in Paraguay, tortured her brother to death mm. under the mm. direction of the dictator then, Stressner. And she also found a statute called the Alien Tort Statute. And the Alien Tort Statute says an alien, it says that a court, a federal court, can hear a case involving an alien who is suing for damages, i.e., that's a tort, for injury caused by a violation of the law of nations. What Judge Friendly said about that statute, he says it's Lohengrin. He said nobody knows where it comes from, nobody knows where it's going. Hmm. In fact, that statute was enacted in the 1790s, probably to help protect victims of pirates. See, in those days, you found a victim of a pirate, you found a pirate, you hang him, wherever he's from, and uh, you find victims of a pirate, you try to use the money to reimburse them, wherever they're from. So the question, right off the bat, is who are today's pirates? And it's pretty easy, as the Second Circuit said, torturers are certainly among that group. And fine. And it seems like, okay, a normal statute. Until you discover cases being brought here against every all oh, people all over the world, pretty hard to figure out who did what and what are the limits of the statute. And I look, I would say, and we've had, we've struggled with this, and so is the Second Circuit. A lot of courts have. Why is it such a struggle? Why does it seem so difficult? I think part of it has to do with what I'd call, and this comes up a lot. See if it isn't in your foreign policy area all the time. What I call legitimacy. But Madison said this very well. Madison said that the difference, he's writing in the 18th century, one difference between America and Europe, he says, in America, our Constitution, our Constitution is power given by liberty rather than liberty given by power. That's one of those things nobody knows what it means. Until you, but, but, but when you think about it, it, I, it is referring to the fact that in Europe, the power is at the center. It was Louis the 16th or the 14th or the 15th. It's the king where the power is. Now, the king might decide to give people liberty, you say, but it's from the center to the people, that liberty. While in the United States, the first premise is that power lies in the people. We, the people of the United States. And it is the people who give the power to the center. And if they don't give it, the government doesn't have it. That's our Constitution. Now, why is that relevant to us today? Is you just wait and see. Go look at the television or any other place, and you'll see how that attitude consciously or unconsciously affects us. And when you start talking, and I don't mean you shouldn't do it, but when, when you start talking about uh, a judge, you sometimes think, well, who is that man or that woman? Well, you take some reassurance from the fact that if they're not elected, at least they are appointed by people who are. And I find in the Senate hearing some effort in the Constitution, which often compromises, to uh, assure people that there is some connection some connection, some legitimacy between the person who's making the decision on a matter that affects you and you or people like you.
But now let's try it with the International Court of Justice. Who are they? And what's our connection with them? You see? And uh, indeed, what about the penal court? Or what about these international institutions? I'm not subscribing to the attitude. I'm saying recognize it and also recognize there is something to it. You have a burden of explanation to explain why that power should be given to those people over there. Right up front when we start talking about the law of nations in this statute. What is that law? Mm -hmm. Who is it? Who wrote it? And how should, did some professor write it somewhere? What's his connection to my democratic vote, et cetera? So it's in there, it's in there. And uh, by the way, uh, there are a lot of things that can be claimed to be like piracy. What about environmental injuries? What about slavery? Of course there's no slave, oh, oh, I see. It's just that they have to work there as indentured service in that foreign country for two cents a month. Oh, are they slaves, are they not? Is that part of the piracy? Hmm, difficult question. And in many foreign countries, but not ours, those matters are handled by labor courts or environmental experts. But we're gonna give them to federal judges or South Africa files a brief in a case in New York, a brief in a case where some plaintiffs were attacking businesses who had engaged in apartheid, and they wanted damages under Dolly Phil Artiga's statute. And, well, South Africa says, stay out of it. We have our own system. It's called truth and reconciliation, and it's working. And we don't want some federal judge from California, because Judge Katzman is here, I don't want to blame New York for everything. <laughs> uh, from California or somewhere, we don't want them interfering. We're knowing what we're doing about apartheid, believe me, we're trying our, we're dealing with this. And we, we're, we're, it's a hard process to get this country over that horror. And uh, that's what they say, you stay out of it. Risk of interference. Or let's go back to your first part, universality. We better interpret this statute in a way that if other countries are going to interpret other statutes similarly, they're not going to be at cross purposes. I mean, you know, the joke that always is made is true the other countries, as soon as they say they're going to start prosecuting something for something that didn't even happen there and some bad thing, they'll start prosecuting Henry Kissinger. Everybody wants to prosecute poor Henry Kissinger. I don't know why. But you see, it's got, it's got to work out in some way that you can universalize the principle. And there is no Supreme Court of the world. There is no Supreme Court that will tell us the answer. So therefore, judges in this country have to be thinking about the universality of the principle that they're applying in a case mm -hmm. that in fact is going to involve a lot of other countries as well. And that comes up. All right, I'm trying to just say it's all over the lot. Mm. So are you trying to harmonize what we're doing with what's happening in other countries? Is that You're trying to get an interpretation that will not be at cross purposes with what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that involves uh, understanding what they're trying to do and what wouldn't work and what would muck them up and what would work, what would allow our institutions to work better together. So that's why I call that harmonization. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful not to make it too strong. Mm -hmm. It has to be yes to a degree, yes. Now, um, kind of the highest profile uh, area in which U.S. courts have been concerned with what's happened abroad uh, has been in the constitutional law area, which is really, it's a small part of your book, uh, but it's the, the reviews have, have focused on that in large part. And um, so one of the big debates that you and Justice Scalia were participating in is, can U.S. courts in constitutional law cite foreign decisions? Um, mm -hmm. You think they should? I don't see any harm in it, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, um, well, let me go in a different direction first. Okay. Let me show you what I think of as the big constitutional questions. Uh, I can't even name exactly what they are because I'm not certain how they'll come up. And then let's get back to that mm -hmm. one. And I'll ask them a question because I think it's, it was surprising to me. How many organizations do you think there are in the world, whether they're created by treaty or in some other way, that in fact can, through little bureaucracies, make rules 
that affect what Americans, or what, no, but put it more broadly, what people in more than one country have to do or can't do. You get it? Some kind of in practice binding rule. And it's an organization that is international and uh, created likely by treaty, but possibly in other ways. How many think, if you think about it, how many think there are more than 50? Raise your hands. Yeah, raise your hand if you do. How many think there are more than 500? How many think they're more than 1,000? Anybody think they're more than 2,000? Yeah, if you read the book or you know otherwise, there are more than 2,000. <laughs> and we belong to probably close to 1,000. They're all over the place. They're not just the UN and the International Trade Organization. I mean, there's the Bluefin Whale Commission. There, there's the International Olive Oil Council. That's a good one. And, and uh, uh, they're all over the lot. Well, there's Burn. Uh, the, the, who goes to Burn? All the banks? and all the regulators from the SEC, and regulators from a lot of other countries. And uh, they go there, and they talk about what to do, and they decide what we should do next. And then they come back here, and they publish notice and comment rulemaking, and somebody's going to say, as they have said, you're just saying you want our opinion on a rule that you've already decided what it is, and you decided what it is in a closed room in Bern, and you never let us comment on it there. And uh, can they have to do that? Who knows? And do they have the power? And what power? And to what extent can we uh, delegate uh, power to these organizations and what not? Sound familiar? Sounds like the New Deal to me. And, and uh, why? Because you say, who are these agencies? What are they? And if you say all power can be delegated to the, oh, no power, how are we going to solve the problems? Environment, security, health, <coughs> commerce. All power? Hey, what happened to Article I of the Constitution, which says the legislative power of the United States is in a Congress of the United States? And if you think this is a made-up history or a made-up uh, classroom question, go read what the Germans court, what the Austrian court, what the Italian court said when they had to answer similar questions in respect to can, under the German Constitution, the federal government grant full lawmaking power to the Union, the European Union. Hmm. Three courts all said no. They can't. Not complete power. But they've never found a case that couldn't be granted. So, hmm. You see, these are real questions. And they're lurking out there. Now, why am I saying that? In part because I think, and I could talk about this, I think the question of whether you should refer to a case somebody else wrote uh, in a foreign country um, is not such a real question. I mean, it may be politically have tremendous valence, uh, but I don't know that it does too much legally. Now, why do I say that? Well, when I've talked to people who really do think we shouldn't, and there, there Justice Scalia did take a different point of view, I, I'd, I'd say, uh, you know, I can refer to anything I want. I, I, I refer to law review articles. I mean, here is a judge uh, who has, and more and more in the world have uh, judges have jobs like mine. They have constitutions rather like mine, protective of uh, human rights and, and uh, democracy, and problems like mine. So someone with a job like mine and a document like mine and a problem like mine decides a case like mine, why don't I read what he says? I don't have to follow it. I think that's a great argument, right? So the congressman I was talking to said, you're right, you're right, you're right, fine, just don't refer to it in your opinion. <laughs> so I said, well, look, um, you know, some of these countries are having trouble maintaining their democracies and independent judiciaries. And they refer to our cases, we refer to theirs, we've been around a long time, our court, you know, give them a little leg up. They can go to the local legislator and say, see, uh, people pay attention to what that might help them maintain democracy. And so, he said, write them a letter. Write them a letter. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking my arguments are not going to persuade this, uh, this particular congressman, and I want to persuade him. And uh, how? Because what he's thinking, and you should see, but now there are a lot of people who think this, and it's not such a terrible thing to think. We have important values. And they're American values. We're not saying they don't exist other, elsewhere, too. But, but they are. We have these values. And we're worried about them being watered down. That's what they're worried about. And so partly, I want to say here, read what our dockets actually like. 
and then apply when I tell you what it's like. Realize it's reflecting the world. It's not the idea of one judge or some philosophy. It's reflecting what exists out there in the world. And there are problems in the world. As I've said, as we all know, security, environment, commerce, health, all kinds of problems. And there's no way, you know, to deal with this, these problems, except through various forms of cooperation. And if we're not part of that effort, it's going to go on without us. And if it goes on without us, we'll be affected by what other people do anyway. You see, this is a long argument, but what I'm trying to say is by the time you read this, and I wouldn't mind if you did, I hope what you will come to the conclusion is that the best way to preserve our American values is to remain aware of what goes on outside our borders and to participate in these efforts, you say. But I can't tell someone that, I just did, but, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I can't, they have to come to that conclusion. And the best way to bring them to that conclusion, I think, is to show them what's going on. And that's what I'm trying to do. So let me follow up on that. So why mm -hmm. did you write the book? Well, I think I wanted to do that. And if I want to be more Fourth of July speech about it, uh, I, I would say with the document, because I believe it, you get judges and people in public life do believe this, absolutely. I mean, my goodness. Uh, you know, we are not a country where we can appeal for unity to King Arthur. We are not all descended from King Arthur. And we are not all descended from Pepin the Short. Get it? We're a large, diverse group of people of every race, every religion, every point of view imaginable. And one of the things that holds together the 314 million of us is this document. So we have more than many at stake in preserving a rule of law. We have more than many, because that helps more than any King Arthur in holding us together. And I see that every day, every day in my job. So I tend to think like when I was in India at 9-11, Sandra O'Connor and I were there on the day of 9-11. And uh, wow, and, the, and the, the, the Indians that we met there, the lawyers, the judges, the others were very sympathetic, very helpful. The chief justice there said, don't go home, continue the meetings. We won't have any dinners and so forth, but continue the meetings, quite right, quite right. But I came away from that particular experience thinking the major divisions of the world are not racial or national, anything like that. They are between those who are committed uh, to a rule of law uh, and those who are not. And that's what we're trying to show. That's what we're trying to show. It's not obvious that the rule of law method can help solve real problems of major sort, security, da, da, et cetera, through the world. But that's what we put our money on. That's what we're betting on. And if we don't try uh, to show that we can make progress through uh, such a system, uh, then there will be others who will urge different methods, which are certainly uh, undesirable. Uh, so there we are. So that's uh, probably what I was thinking, and uh, hope I can make a contribution towards that. Uh, and that's the answer to your questions, and thank you very much. Well, it's, uh... It's a very powerful and inspiring statement of faith in the rule of law and of global jurisprudence as an expression of commitment to the rule of law. Um, now, we have an opportunity. We have a few minutes for questions. We have a microphone. Uh, so I'd like people to line up uh, and ask questions uh, of the justice. But it's really, it's, it's an inspiring book, Justice. And thank, thank you very you. much for writing it. And, Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. So please state your name uh, and uh, ask the justice question. We'd like them to be about the, the court and the world, what we've been talking about. So please start. Hi, uh, Justice Breyer. My name is uh, Billy Moran. Uh, thank you for your service for our to our country. Uh, um, many of us respect you for your concern for the practical uh, implications of the interpretation of the law. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think increasingly our country is facing a kind of clash between different sorts of civil liberties. Uh, uh, for example, I'm thinking in particular of religious liberty and uh, sexual liberty, uh, reproductive liberty. Um, 
it seems to me it seems to me personally that religious liberty should take precedence because it's enumerated in the First Amendment. But um, I'm I'm really curious and interested to hear your sort of standard for determining uh, how, which liberties should take priority when they come into conflict with one another. Uh, how, how that should work out. I can't give you an answer you're going to be happy with because there's yeah. a case on that right in front of us, which but, I'm but staying 25 miles away I, I uh, from maybe, commenting about. Maybe uh, but I'll say general. in general, yeah, in general, the way these things work in general is where, where I think you have a very good point, and people don't always understand it, is the difficult cases in the Supreme Court, and this is trite but true, are very rarely right versus wrong. They are right versus right. That is to say, you have on the one hand freedom of speech, and on the other hand privacy. All right. For example, a case uh, where somebody uh, unlawfully takes a recording of some union leaders who were planning some not very nice activity in a state that forbids that, and then throws it over the transom into a newspaper office, which prints it. Right of privacy violated? Free speech? They're at odds. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard issue. And that's the kind of things that we'll write about. And typically, you don't give a formula, oh, well, this liberty presides over that, this prevails over that. Typically, what happens is it depends on what the facts are in the particular case and the, more na and the legal issues more narrowly described uh, than you've just described them in the broadest terms. Terrific. Uh, next question. Hello. Uh, my name is Dylan Hughes. Thank you for joining us this evening and for your very informative commentary. It's, we really appreciate it a lot. Um, my question is fairly brief and a bit more domestic, if you'll indulge me. Namely, what's your opinion on the current actions of the Senate regarding Merrick Garland, um, specifically in regards to historical precedent of the Senate and the nominating process? This is, see, it's so sad that I'm going to be so closed-mouthed. <laughs> You, see, because, you know, I can tell you why, the reason why, of course, is, I mean, I do get a lot of questions like that, you know, and generally I say, well, look, I did not nominate anyone. What the Constitution says the president nominates and with the advice and consent it can, appoints. With the, so that's what it says. I did not nominate anyone. I did not confirm anyone. I was the nominated person and the confirmed person, I'm pleased to say. But to ask about the process, but at least now I stay a mile away from it. Usually I only stay half a mile. <laughs> but it's rather like asking for the recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. <laughs> Next question. Thank, thank you, Justin Bri Justice Breyer, for coming to this afternoon. My name is Ira Ulaba. I'm a junior at Georgetown, majoring in government and economics. And what I wanted to know, uh, I'm really looking forward to reading your book after finals. And uh, <laughs> I really wanted to know your thoughts on, as we see, you know, Apple, FBI case, and a lot of cases that relates to, you know, large multinational technology companies and the law, what are your thoughts on, on the law and understanding how that works in an international setting yeah. as it relates to information security? And, and it's, hard to go, it's, uh, it's hard for me to say something that you'll find interesting in that because what it means is that the problems in front of us are going to be increasingly complicated, that all the, which I frequently uh, think of uh, when we're talking about the Constitution uh, is that the values that underlie these amendments don't really change. I mean, uh, First Amendment, free expression. Uh, you have uh, freedom of religion, as was just mentioned. The basic values don't change, but the circumstances in which they apply change every five minutes. So go back to commerce. What's the Commerce Clause about? Interstate and foreign commerce. It was about one thing in 1789, uh, but they hadn't thought of uh, the internet, automobiles, etc. And Nino and I used to debate this stuff, you know, in public. And, and uh, I would say, uh, thinking I'd made some great point, you know, uh, the Commerce Clause is there, but George Washington uh, didn't know about the internet. And he would say, uh, I knew that. Good point. <laughs> and he, and uh, I'd say, well, you have to have some change. Yes, he'd say you do. Yeah, I do. It's a question of degree. It's a question of degree. 
And, and then he'd say that between where I tend to, he thinks I've changed, I, I would be too flexible in this in light of the purposes. And I'd say, well, I think maybe sometime you're not flexible enough. And, and what he'd do, this is the great debates, you know, on different, on different approaches towards constitutional law. And, and he would say, which I, I usually, this is a good joke, I thought, and, and so did the audience usually. He'd say, well, it's really like uh, the, uh, um, <laughs> it's like the camper, and he sees his fellow camper putting on his running shoes and says, why are you doing that? And he says, I'm doing this because there's a bear coming towards the camp. And uh, he says, well, uh, you can't outrun a bear. And he says, yeah, but I can outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we are. That's the best I can do. <laughs> Next question. Hello, Justice Breyer. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. And I actually read your book over Christmas. Um, and one of the things as a lowly undergraduate that I found most fascinating was the alien tort statute. And I was wondering that after Kiobel, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, but uh, what exactly is left of the alien tort statute? Will, it continue, will the presumption against extraterritoriality uh, continue, or do you think the court will uh, come up with a different uh, framework? Well, my flip answer to that is Yogi Berra. You know, I never make predictions, at least not about the future. And the, the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, uh, fact, but less flip, is you, if you read that case, and I tried to describe it as accurately as I can, I think you'll be left with uncertainty. And uh, we've narrowed it, but uncertainty. And there are those who think, no, I've, I've slanted this in my own direction, which is more open uh, to use of the statute. And others think, no, I, I haven't uh, uh, given, uh, it's, it's more flexible even than I think. And so like, like most opinions that are very close, that are split, and that have some ambiguity in them, you have to go back. And you have to read them and then make up your own mind and try to work out how you might argue it one way or the other way. That's why he has this great faculty of law professors and law students who are there every day trying to do just that. And we hope that you're there soon. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, my name's Matt. I'm a graduate student in the government department. Uh, at least among sort of legal laymen, one of the areas in which the United States is often held to be rather exceptional is in the way that um, we view speech, and in particular things like hate speech and speech that is sometimes considered disharmonious. Um, I'm wondering what you think about developments in that area of thinking about the law abroad and what you think the United States uh, can take from that, if anything. Well, this is what you could do as a research project, be pretty interesting. There are countries, like Germany, for example, where you can understand this, uh, and France, and they have laws that do uh, make it permissible to punish people for hate speech, uh, maybe even denying the Holocaust, or uh, maybe throwing some racial group into disrespect. That is not our approach. And my personal view is, of course, perhaps biased by the fact that I am American and uh, I have been on the court. And I think our approach is, for at least this country, is, is, is the correct one. And our approach is, uh, and oh, I say that because we're made up of so many different groups. And it's so easy to say and so easy to forget. You know, the normal human attitude when he hears or she hears a person say something they think is just awful. They think, yes, the First Amendment. Oh, but not that. Not that. I mean, say something that agrees with me. Just a little bit more. I mean, no, no, you can be against me, but not that. And you have to remind people that the First Amendment is not there for people you agree with. And it is not there. It is not there for people whom you don't agree with, but you don't really think are really awful. It's there for the people you think are really awful. That's why we have it. And, and a university is a place, I think, that exhibits the need for this and the importance of it more than any other place. Because if you don't have people in a university who say weird things, <laughs> even if they're terrible, you're never going to have them. 
Because once you get out of this place, you will see pressures for conformity beyond what you can imagine. And the trouble with the pressure for conformity is you give in to that and you stifle thought, you know, all those things that everybody knows. So I would say I'd start with the university, but I think it's good that we apply it in society. That this First Amendment is there for people we think are saying things that are detestable. And if it's not there for them, who is it for? And there we are. That's just, that's just drilled into our bones. Uh, so I have a non-flexible view on that. Well, that's very, I have to say, the, you know, as you said, the university is a place for dialogue and discussion. Mm -hmm. And this conversation is dialogue and discussion at the highest level. It's just been such a privilege to be able to listen to you and to learn from you, Justice Breyer. So on behalf of all of us, please, a round of applause. We have some closing remarks. Yep. Uh, the, I'd like to call the stage Professor Charles King. Thank you very much. It remains only for me to uh, thank all of you for attending, to thank the friends and family of Marvin and Sheva Bernstein. Uh, could I also ask that all of you, though, remain seated until the uh, stage party has uh, left uh, the hall this evening. Uh, this symposium has long been organized by a former professor in the Department of Government, a person who, although he has left Georgetown, is still very much an eternal Hoya, as you heard earlier this evening. That's, of course, Chief Judge Robert Katzman of the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Thank you so much, Bob, for your, the amazing support that you continue, continue to offer to our students and our faculty. The government department itself is a community of some 60 faculty, more than 200 undergraduate majors, and more than 100 graduate students in one of four innovative master's programs and a highly competitive PhD program. We are honored to be the home each year for the university's Bernstein Lecture and are also grateful to our own staff, not least Ann Musica and Mary Cruz Luna, and the, uh, the incredible support we receive each year from the Office of the President for playing the very important role behind the scenes in making events such as this uh, happen. As you exit, uh, in the downstairs hallway outside the chaplain's offices, we have copies of Justice Breyer's latest book, The Court in the World, which will be distributed free uh, to those in attendance. Your program is your ticket. Show that. Um, on the way down and you will receive a copy of the book. However, again, let me remind you that uh, the audience should remain seated while the stage participants depart the hall. Finally, please join me again in thanking uh, Dean William Trainer of the Georgetown Law Center and our distinguished guest this evening, Justice Stephen Breyer. Thank you. <laughs>